The story of the golden calf in Exodus is a perplexing one. Consider the context. After generations of slavery in Egypt, Moses and Aaron receive divine revelation from Yahweh, perform wonders in Pharaoh's presence, and then lead the Israelites through the miraculously parted sea toward the Promised Land. Three months later, they reach the holy mountain of Sinai, and while Moses is off communing with God, it somehow makes sense to Aaron and the Israelites to make a golden cow of all things and to worship it. The violence of Moses' reaction upon his return is no less astonishing. Fast forward many centuries along the biblical timeline, past the time of Joshua, the period of the Judges, and the Golden Age of David and Solomon, to the reign of Jeroboam, the first king of Samaria. Jeroboam creates two golden calf idols and commands the Israelites to worship them, an act regarded as Israel's greatest sin and the reason for its eventual conquest by Assyria. These two stories are clearly connected, but untangling their relationship is one of the most challenging puzzles in biblical studies today. Let's start with the golden calf story in Exodus 32. I would summarize it like this. Moses is up on Mount Sinai receiving the tablets of the covenant from Yahweh. The people get tired of waiting and ask Aaron to make new gods to lead them so Aaron collects their golden rings and makes a golden calf. The people then proclaim, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Aaron builds an altar for the calf and establishes a new festival, which is celebrated the following day. Back on the mountain, Yahweh tells Moses what is going on and threatens to destroy the people. Moses intercedes and changes Yahweh's mind. Moses heads down the mountain with the tablets, and he and Joshua hear the people celebrating. When Moses sees the calf, he smashes the tablets, burns the calf, grinds it to powder, sprinkles it in the water, and makes the Israelites drink it. He confronts Aaron, who blames the people and says the calf formed itself after the gold was thrown into the fire. Then, at the command of Yahweh, the sons of Levi march through the camp, slaughtering the Israelites. This act ordains the Levites as priests and earns them Yahweh's blessing. Afterward, Moses, acting as if the previous massacre had not happened, returns up the mountain to once again intercede for the people. Yahweh agrees to let the people reach the promised land, but says that when the day comes for punishment, he will punish them. The story ends with Yahweh sending a plague on the people for the calf. In comparison, here is a summary of the story in 1 Kings 12. Jeroboam son of Nebat has returned from Egypt and become king of Israel by popular demand. He wants to prevent the people from offering their sacrifices to Yahweh in Jerusalem, lest they desire to rejoin the house of David. So he makes two golden calves and proclaims, Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. He places the idols in Bethel and Dan, establishes new temples, and appoints non-Levitical priests to serve at the altar in Bethel. He also establishes a new festival day for worship in Bethel. A widely cited 1967 paper by Moses Aberbach and Levi Smoller demonstrates 13 parallels between the two stories. In particular, both stories involve golden calves, the same proclamation with nearly identical wording, the establishment of altars and religious feasts, and a deliberate distinction between the Levite and non-Levite priests. In other words, we are dealing with the same story set in two different eras. The most decisive evidence that these stories are connected is the intriguing fact that the sons of Aaron and the sons of Jeroboam are given the same names, Nadab and Abihu slash Abijah. In both cases, the sons of Aaron and Jeroboam also die premature deaths. The authors of the paper note, Viewing the problem from a more critical angle, one can hardly escape the conclusion, startling though it may be, that the figure of Aaron as he appears in the Golden Calf story is, to all intents and purposes, identical with Jeroboam. It seems clear that one of these stories served as inspiration for the other, but the direction of dependence is not obvious. These stories contain several disparate elements that need to be explained, such as the identity and purpose of the golden calves, the motivations of Aaron and Jeroboam, the involvement of the Levites, and the underlying historical context.
Let's tackle the easy part of this riddle first. Which god or gods are the calf idols supposed to represent? Although connections with Egyptian bovine deities like Hathor and Apis, or the Canaanite deity Baal Hadad have been proposed in the past, the majority of scholars think the calf simply represented Yahweh himself. The primary reasons for this were summarized by John Day in his 2002 book Yahweh and the Gods and Goddesses of Canaan. There is no evidence for any tradition that named a god other than Yahweh as Israel's deliverer from Egypt. Aaron's festival to celebrate the golden calves is specifically a festival for Yahweh, and Jeroboam's festival is said to be like the festival in Judah, i.e. a rival Yahwist festival. Jeroboam's son, Abijah, has a Yahwistic name. Sumerian Ostrakhan 41, dated to roughly the time of Jeroboam II, contains a personal name meaning calf of Yahweh or Yahweh is a calf. The Canaanite god El, whose characteristics were eventually subsumed by Yahweh, was identified as a bull in Ugaritic texts. The earliest Jacob traditions associated him with Bethel, and while the Bible sometimes refers to Jacob's god as Abir Yaakob, the mighty one of Jacob, this is probably a misreading of Abir Yaakob, the bull of Jacob, which is written the same way in ancient Hebrew. More generally speaking, religious iconography with bulls is found throughout the ancient Near East, and a few bull figurines have even been found at ancient Ugarit, Tyre, and Hazor. Of particular interest is an open-air religious sanctuary near Samaria, where a bronze figurine 17.5 cm in length was discovered. Potsherds date the site to the 12th century BCE, which is a few hundred years too early, but the existence of a bull cult within the territory of early Israel is suggestive. Lastly, there is the ancient inscription found at Kuntalent Adrud in the Sinai, which mentions Yahweh of Samaria and his Asherah, accompanied by a drawing of a god and goddess with bovine features. The Old Testament describes several different priestly orders, including the Levites, Aaronites, Zadokites, Korahites, and Mushites. The origins of these groups and their historical roles in Israelite religion are far from clear, as Mark Lucher, one of the foremost experts on the Israelite priesthoods, explains in his book The Levites and the Boundaries of Israelite Identity. According to Lucher, most scholars support the view that the Levites were a cast of clerics who conducted sacrifices at rural temples and shrines throughout Israel and Judah. The gradual centralization of Yahweh worship at Jerusalem, however, seems to have favored the Zadokites as the main priests, with the Levites relegated to menial duties. The Aaronides, on the other hand, are often assumed to have been based in the Northern Kingdom, and at Bethel in particular. This is mainly because Judges 20 describes a grandson of Aaron as serving at the Bethel Shrine. The Aaronides are also the priesthood preferred by the late priestly writer of the Pentateuch, and they seem to have been the only ones permitted to conduct sacrifices in the Second Temple after the Exile. I'll have more to say about this a bit further on. A widely accepted conclusion of scholarship over the past century or so has been that a theological school or movement, known as the Deuteronomists, crafted a narrative spanning from Moses to the divided monarchies of Israel and Judah, the story encompassed by the books of Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. This school, which emerged during the exile, argued that the conquest of Israel and Judah by the Assyrians and Babylonians was divine punishment for Israel's failure to uphold its covenant with Yahweh, a covenant that demanded complete loyalty to Yahweh and the banning of sacrifices outside the Jerusalem temple. The other four books of the Pentateuch were composed from other sources that often expanded on the themes of the Deuteronomists, though not always with the same perspective. Regarding the golden calves then, the dominant view until recently was that the Jeroboam story was largely historically accurate. To counter the growing political influence of Jerusalem, Jeroboam I had introduced innovations in the Yahweh cult, including the establishment of calf idols at Bethel and Dan, and a new priestly dynasty known as the Aaronites. The Deuteronomists, however, saw Jeroboam's rejection of the Jerusalem temple and the Levite priesthood as an unforgivable heresy and the main reason for Samaria's downfall. The authors of Exodus later adapted the story from 1 Kings, retrojecting the golden calf heresy back into the time of Moses to pin the sin of idolatry on the entire Israelite population. The use of the plural gods to refer to a single calf idol 
is easily explained as an allusion to the original proclamation by Jeroboam, which concerned two calves rather than one. The rehabilitation of Aaron may have been a political compromise after the Persian authorities decided to put Aaronite priests in charge of the post-exilic temple. The broader contours of this interpretation might be correct, but recent scholarship has uncovered several problems that necessitate a fresh approach to the Golden Calf stories. The most serious flaw in the scenario I just described is that according to recent analyses of the excavation data from Bethel and Dan by some of Israel's top archaeologists, both locations were unoccupied during the late 10th century when Jeroboam I is supposed to have ruled. In fact, the city of Dan was originally built by the Aramean king Hazael and was only later annexed by Israel. As German scholar Angelica Belleung puts it, the Golden Calf story in 1 Kings provides no reliable historical information about the time of Jeroboam I. However, Bethel and Dan were both at the height of prosperity during the mid-8th century when Jeroboam II ruled Samaria. Thus, some experts, including Berliung and Thomas Raymer, think that the Deuteronomist was retrojecting late religious controversies into the past to portray Samaria as corrupt and idolatrous from its very inception. Within the biblical story itself, Jeroboam's exclusion of the Levites is a problem. According to the tradition recounted in Judges 17 and 18, the temple at Dan was founded by a Levite priest from Judah which contradicts the Jeroboam story in 1 Kings. Next, if we examine the Jeroboam story more closely, the accusation that Jeroboam excluded the Levites at Bethel and Dan actually makes no sense. As Rabbi S. David Sperling points out in a recent book, if the calves were indeed idols, would it have been more meritorious to appoint Levite priests to the service? In other words, if Jeroboam's primary sin was idolatry, then the fact that he used the wrong kind of priests to oversee it is hardly relevant. 1 Kings 13.33 and 2 Kings 17.32 repeat the accusation that Jeroboam appointed priests for the high places, or hilltop shrines, but there is no mention of Levites or their exclusion. Due to these and other textual issues, Many scholars think that the remark about non-Levite priests was a later addition to 1 Kings 12. In fact, the priests of Dan and Bethel probably were Levites. So why was the Levite exclusion added? The answer involves more priestly politics. As Jeung John explains in a recent paper, the book of Ezekiel accuses the Levites of leading Israel into idolatry in chapter 44, and Ezekiel forbids them from serving as priests in the future. This chapter holds the Levites responsible for Sumerian religious practices that were unacceptable from Jerusalem's perspective. Whoever revised the Jeroboam story, however, probably wanted to repair the Levites' reputation and disassociate them from the idolatry of the Northern Kingdom. The Chronicler takes these efforts further in his version of the Golden Calf story by having the Levites abandon Jeroboam and emigrate en masse to Judah. So what about the Levites in the Exodus Golden Calf story? Bible scholar Joel Baden might have the answer there. As Exodus 32 is currently written, the Levites slaughter the Israelites as punishment for the golden calf and are ordained as priests as a result. However, these verses appear to be out of place and do not actually mention the golden calf. Furthermore, the people were already punished by Moses in verse 20, and in verses 30 to 33, Moses asks Yahweh to forgive them, a request that makes little sense after punishment has already been meted out. Baden shows that the Levite massacre was probably moved to this position from Exodus 17, where it originally followed the story of Moses striking the rock at Meribah to provide water for the ungrateful Israelites. This fits well with Deuteronomy 33, which says that the Levites were tested at Meribah and disregarded their kinship ties in favor of obeying Yahweh, thus earning their status as priests. Verse 11 suggests that their adversaries were crushed in the process. Furthermore, the shorter version of the Golden Calf story found in Deuteronomy 9 does not mention the Levite slaughter. In short, the Levites did not originally figure in either of the Golden Calf stories. Aaron's part in the Golden Calf story is complicated. He functions as the ringleader of the calf cult, yet he personally escapes all consequences, blaming the people instead. James Watts, noting that summaries of the Golden Calf story in Psalm 106 and Nehemiah 9 do not mention Aaron, 
believes that Exodus 32 actually means to exonerate Aaron by contrasting him with the sinful people. The idea that Aaronite priests served in pre-exilic Israel is also a problem. The exilic prophets seem to know nothing about him, even Ezekiel, who is particularly concerned with a temple and priesthood. The reference to an Aaronite priest at Bethel in Judges 20 is generally seen as a late priestly addition. It is only the post-exilic books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles where the Aaronite priesthood plays an important role. The description of the Aaronite priest's clothing in Exodus 28 includes linen trousers. However, trousers were unknown in the ancient Near East until the Persians introduced them for horseback riding in the 6th century BCE. Prior to that, both men and women wore skirt-like garments. As S. David Sperling puts it, the implications of trousers for dating the final form of the priestly source are obvious. No biblical writer would have seen Iranian garb before the 6th century BCE. In other words, the passages in the Pentateuch related to the Aaronide priests were still being revised during the exile or the period of Persian rule when the new temple was being established. They are more likely to reflect concerns of the early Second Temple period than the situation in pre-exilic Samaria. Within the Bible itself, the golden calves are a problem, because the narrative of First and Second Kings does not always support the view that the sin of Jeroboam was the golden calves. In First Kings, immediately after Jeroboam places the calves at Bethel and Dan, we have a story about an unnamed prophet of Yahweh who comes from Judah to Bethel to denounce Jeroboam and the altar. However, there is no condemnation of the calf idols in this episode. Elijah, the greatest exemplar of a faithful prophet in the Bible, was based in the Northern Kingdom. In 1 Kings, he zealously participates in exterminating the priests of Baal. However, he never once raises any objection to the golden calves. Even his ascension to heaven takes place on the occasion of a visit to Bethel, while a large company of priests of Yahweh from Bethel waits on him. These are the very same priests who would have been tending the calf idol and altar in the Bethel temple built by Jeroboam. Elijah's successor Elisha, who is also active in and around Bethel, similarly raises no objection to the golden calf during his prophetic career. This is simply unbelievable if the golden calves were universally understood as wicked by the authors of 1st and 2nd Kings. There is also tension in the story of King Jehu, who, out of faithfulness to Yahweh, goes to great lengths to slaughter all the priests of Baal in Israel. In 2 Kings 10.30, Yahweh directly addresses Jehu and promises that his descendants, up to the fourth generation, will sit on Israel's throne, because he did what was right in Yahweh's eyes. But in the very next verse, it hastens to add that Jehu did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam. The text is trying to have it both ways. Finnish scholar Yuha Pakala has noted that outside of the Jeroboam story, 1st and 2nd Kings mention the golden calves only twice. However, they consistently criticize the Bamot, which were hilltop shrines, and the altars to Asherah and Baal without mentioning the bulls. Through careful analysis of the text of the Jeroboam story, Pakala shows that the references to the calves are, in fact, secondary additions. The earliest layer of the Jeroboam story did not mention them. Jeroboam's problem, according to verses 26 and 27, is that the people might keep going to the Jerusalem temple for sacrifices. The creation of the golden calves in verses 28 to 30 doesn't really address that problem. The actual solution to his problem is found in verse 31, where he establishes new shrines with priests to conduct sacrifices. Furthermore, the word he in verse 31 refers to the king in verse 28, which was originally its immediate antecedent. The additional verses disrupt this connection and make the grammar ambiguous. The other verses where the calves are mentioned are also suspect. For example, 1 Kings 14.9 accuses Jeroboam of being more evil than all his predecessors by making molten images. But whoever wrote that statement seems to have forgotten that Jeroboam was the first king of Samaria. He had no predecessors. As Pakala observes, the author is already looking at the whole spectrum of Israelite kings and forgot that he is dealing with the first one. In other words, the narrative we have makes more sense if it was not originally concerned with the golden calves. This does not mean that the calves did not exist. However, it does mean that ideas about why Israel was punished with exile evolved while the Bible was still being written. These ideas were shaped by various controversies and disagreements within the Israelite diaspora.
In Genesis 28, there is a very important story about how Jacob, the great ancestor of Israel, first encountered God at Bethel. Jacob sees a vision of Yahweh and sets up a sacred stone, or Masaba, which he consecrates with oil. In preserving this story, Genesis legitimates and promotes the religious shrine and altar at Bethel by appealing to Jacob's importance in Israelite tradition. Many leading Old Testament scholars, including Thomas Raymer and Albert de Puy, believe that the Jacob tradition of peaceful settlement in Israel and the tradition of Egyptian origins were once rival viewpoints held by different factions. This rivalry comes into focus in the book of Hosea. Unlike Genesis, the author of Hosea despises Jacob, describing him as a cheater who did not encounter the real Yahweh. In the womb, Jacob cheated his brother. Grown to manhood, he strove with a divinity. He strove with an angel and triumphed. The other did weep and implore him. It was at Bethel that he met him, so there he invokes him by name. But Yahweh, the God of hosts, cannot be invoked but as Yahweh. According to Hosea, Jacob is a deluded fool whose shrine should not be called Bethel, which means house of God, but Beth Avon, or House of Delusion. Over and over, the text warns Judahites not to worship there. Hosea 10 contains a polemic against the priests and the golden calf in Bethel, which it says has been carried away to Assyria as tribute. It refers to the sanctuaries of Avon, that is, Bethel, as Israel's sin, and it gloats over the destruction of Samaria and its king at the hands of Assyria. In chapter 8, Hosea condemns the calf of Samaria, which has been broken to pieces due to Assyria's invasion. It's not clear if this is the same Bethel calf or another idol that was located in Samaria, the Israelite capital. These polemics against Jacob and Bethel are connected with Hosea's view that Israel and its God are Egyptian in origin. I am Yahweh, your God from the land of Egypt. I will make you live in tents again as in the days of the appointed festival. Hosea's references to Egyptian origins, living in tents, and festivals are all repeated in the Jeroboam story. Hosea also seems to reflect an earlier, simpler version of the Exodus tradition. It does not mention Moses or Aaron, and it says nothing of enslavement, plagues, a sea crossing, and so on. Perhaps Hosea's decision to condemn the golden calves and promote an Egyptian origin for Israel inspired the authors of Exodus to combine these ideas. According to Angelica Berliung, the Israelites and their neighbors believed that the welfare of their country, king, and people depended on the divine presence of deities that existed simultaneously in the cosmic realm, usually heaven or the underworld, and in temples on earth. In traditional Near Eastern temples, an image or statue of the god or goddess was necessary to ensure their presence. Conversely, the destruction of those images was linked with divine punishment and absence. Both the Bible and archaeology show that divine presence markers were part of the national religion in monarchic Judah and Samaria. While Samaria had its bull statues, Jerusalem had the Ark of the Covenant, the Nehushtan, sacred pillars, the bronze cauldron carried by twelve bulls, an Asherah pole, and so on. Religious figurines are found by the thousands in ancient Judahite sites, and divine standing stones or Masabot were also commonplace. Some scholars argue that even the Jerusalem temple must have had an iconic image of Yahweh, though this question remains unresolved for now. That began to change with the rebuilding of the Jerusalem temple under the Persians, an event that Berliung dates to around 440 BCE. The new temple authorities had adopted an iconism, an ideology that prohibited divine images. An iconism itself was not new, but the endpoint of an ancient trend in West Semitic religion. Historian Trigvi Mettinger has shown that aniconism evolved from the Canaanite preference for blood rites, communal meals, and massabout shrines, in contrast to Mesopotamian religion, which favored cultic statues and the symbolic feeding of the gods. Furthermore, the Persian religion of Zoroastrianism was also aniconic and made no use of statues, so many scholars believe that Jewish aniconism could have been due in part to Zoroastrian influence. Hosea's criticism of the calves represents an intermediate phase because there are other passages in which he speaks approvingly of standing stones, teraphim statues, and ephods used in Israelite temples. Jewish scholar Benjamin D. Sommer concludes, Thus Hosea seems open to the notion of divine embodiment in non-representational objects, such as pillars and poles, but not to the notion of divine embodiment in representational sculptures. 
Some are further notes that the objection to the golden calf in Exodus 32 was probably not the notion of God's presence in the statue, but the representational nature of the statue. After all, when Moses first arrived at Mount Sinai in chapter 24, he had created a shrine with an altar and 12 standing stones. Ironically, Jewish aniconism in its final form banned even the massa boat that had been so instrumental in the development of aniconism itself. It seems likely that the earliest layer of the golden calf story was not about idolatry, but about a religious rivalry between Jerusalem and Bethel. Although the Exodus 32 story is somewhat later than 1 Kings 12, both stories were expanded through one or more realms of revision. And the condemnation of the golden calf was probably dependent in some way on Hosea's criticisms of the northern kingdom and the loss of its calf idols during the Assyrian conquest. Ultimately, the golden calves illustrate the ideological differences that motivated the authors of the Bible during and after the exile. The use of religious images versus an iconism. Rivalry between different priestly orders. Disputes about religious centralization and disagreement over Israel's origin traditions.